I'll give you the truth. I'll give you the facts without spin. Whenever YouTubers start a presentation with a statement like that, it's a red flag. Why did they feel the need to make a great show of telling you how honest they are, in the same way that most undemocratic countries have to insist so forcefully that they're democratic? Later in the video, we'll check the guy in the beanie hat sources and see if he's as truthful as he claims to be. I was hoping to end this series on COVID, but several people asked me to fact-check claims that PCR tests don't work. So, without further ado, let's go through the claims one by one, starting with this one. That PCR tests can't distinguish between a live virus and a non-infectious virus. This picture going around Facebook looks as though it comes from the Australian government. And in fact, part of it does. It can be found here. And this particular claim is true. So we're off to a good start. PCR is a way of amplifying parts of DNA in order to make sample sizes large enough to be identified. It can do the same thing with RNA, the stuff SARS-CoV-2 is made of, by first converting it into DNA. Now there is a method for estimating the viral load, and it's dependent on the number of cycles a sample has to go through in order to be amplified enough for easy detection. But that's a little technical. All we need to know is that PCR can detect a virus and tell you whether someone is infected, but not necessarily whether they're still infectious. But then the Facebook claim starts to unravel. This means the test cannot distinguishing co- what? Cannot distinguishing COVID from a cold or measles or Ebola. No, it doesn't mean that at all. And if you haven't guessed, that part of the statement doesn't come from virologists advising the Department of Health. It's just ungrammatical claptrap tacked on by some anonymous Facebook user and then passed around. But hey, this is the internet, where ungrammatical claptrap is just as good as scientific research. So if we want it to be true, all we have to do is believe it and pass it on. Unfortunately, too many people don't use the internet as a tool for serious investigation. It's a place where one person gets an idea, and for no reason other than a willingness to believe, someone copies it and passes it on. And before you know it, it's gone viral, and everyone is moving in the same direction, without even understanding how or why the movement got started. Do your own research basically means checking to see if everyone else is following the same belief, and if they are, then it must be right. So if you want to know what the internet would look like if it took human form, it looks like this. I'll give you the truth. I'll give you the facts without spin. Now, bloke in beanie looks like the kind of guy I'd love to have a beer with, but I wouldn't necessarily trust him to give me the facts and the truth about polymerase chain reactions. He was one of three video makers highlighted by the Australian newspaper as what it calls an emerging group of coronavirus deniers telling its tens of thousands of followers that the pandemic is a government conspiracy. Of course, Bloke Mbini is welcome to his opinion, but he's not welcome to his own facts about PCR tests. Now, these tests, the PCR testing wasn't invented for the coronavirus or COVID-19 to pursue to specifically test for that. These tests were invented way back for HIV and, and other, um, other things. Actually, they weren't designed for any specific DNA or any specific virus, and certainly not for HIV, which wasn't even identified and named until three years after PCR was invented. Carrie Mullis, the guy who came up with the idea for PCR, and his colleagues, let's not forget, discovered a method for copying DNA to make quantities that were easier to analyse. And that was a hugely useful tool in everything from forensics and botany to tracing your personal ancestry. Identifying viruses was simply another useful application. But now Bloke Mbini is going to quote Carrie Mullis directly, so that should clear things up. Now, I'm just going to read you a quote from the inventor of these tests. Now, these tests... Hold on, he is going to quote Carrie Mullis. Just a minute. I will not tell you this. And this is directly quoted from 
the doctor or Carrie B. Mullis, the person who invented these PCR tests. Okay, he's going to quote Carrie Mullis any second now. So what Carrie B. Mullis says, um, Remy and Damon, you might want to sort of get out your little pens and pencils and take... The Carrie Mullis quote is coming up now. This is it. I wouldn't even wipe my bum with that, but anyway. Um, Now, the PCR basically takes a sample of your cells and amplifies any DNA, mm, any DNA, to look for viral sequences, i.e. bits of non-human DNA that seem to match parts of a known viral genome. Now, in case you're doubting that these are the words of Carrie Mullis, just go to that source of the truth, the internet. Remember the mantra of conspiracy theorists, do your own research. That means if we put part of the text into a search engine and enough people are quoting the same thing, and all of them say it was written by Carrie Mullis, then that must be true. I mean, surely Bloke in Beanie isn't just reading some nonsense he found on the internet, copied and pasted by someone else on the internet, from something that had been mindlessly passed around the internet by hundreds of other people, and not one of them bothered to fact-check it, right? I mean, that would be too stupid for words. PCR basically takes a sample of your cells and amplifies any DNA. The problem is the test is known not to work. These are his words, not mine. It uses an application, it uses application, which means taking a very, very tiny amount of DNA and growing it exponentially until it can be analysed. Obviously, any minute contaminants, contaminations in the sample will also be amplified, leading to potentially gross errors of discovery. The idea these kits can isolate a specific virus like COVID-19 is nonsense. Well, as Bloke in Beanie would say, the problem is... The problem is that COVID-19 wasn't named until February 2020 and Carrie Mullis died in August 2019. So you won't see any comment from Carrie Mullis about COVID-19, and if you do, it's either a fake or it's the work of a mystic who's managed to contact him from beyond the grave. In other words, also fake. So where does it come from? Well, here's exactly the same chunk of text, but this time not attributed to Carrie Mullis, but to a nurse speaking out. Here's the same chunk of text, this time pasted onto a forum purporting to come from someone who works in the healthcare field. Over time, the statement has been attributed to a nurse, someone who works in the healthcare field, a widely respected professional scientist, and, of course, the inventor of PCR dictating from beyond the grave. So where does it really come from? I'll give you the truth. No thanks, you've had your chance. The best way to find out who did write it is to put part of the text into the search bar again, and this time use time parameters in the search engine. I kept tracking the quote back until I found what seems to be the second oldest version of it in a March 21 blog called Revealing Fraud. It cited a blog called Occam's Razor Terror Events, and there it was sandwiched between 9-11 conspiracy theories and claims that the pandemic is a hoax designed to exert mind control. So the author is a blogger. Now that may sound like an impeccable source if you think that anything you read on a blog must be true, but we can all agree it's not Carrie Mullis. So there you go. I thought I would just clear that up for you. So if you'd like, you know, share this around for a bit of uh, clarity. So even though we know that Bloke in Beanie is just passing on something he read on the internet without checking it, and even though this quote doesn't come from Carrie Mullis, he's asking you to pass it on without checking it. So that's not really clearing anything up. It's just acting like a bunch of people who believe anything they see on the internet. There's also another quote attributed to Carrie Mullis doing the rounds. These PCR tests cannot detect free infectious viruses at all. So, is that one genuine? Well, this one's being passed around by someone who laughably calls himself to your own research. Because, of course, the extent of his research was to read this on a website and then repeat it. If he did any further research, it was just to put the quote into a search engine and discover that a lot of other people on the internet are also saying Carrie Mullis said this, 
pass it along. And under internet rules, if enough people are copying and pasting the same thing, then it must be true. But none of them say where the quote comes from or what it's referring to. So let's not just follow the flock, let's do some proper research and find out. Again, by tracking this disembodied quote back with a time search. It comes from this 1998 article by John Lauritsen about HIV AIDS. Not only was the quote wrongly attributed to Carrie Mullis, Lauritsen's explanation of what he was talking about is entirely missing. So let's put it back. Lauritsen never said PCR can't identify viruses, but they can't measure the quantity of viruses, as we've seen. To use an analogy, it's a bit like being asked to identify what type of car is being produced at an auto plant. I can't tell you how many cars there are in the plant's holding area, but I can tell you what make and model they are. OK, so let's turn it over to the forum now. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Julian French. Why are there so many videos of empty hospitals? Why aren't we discussing healthy lifestyles? Where has the flu gone? Why are the local elitists making okay, billions I of money? OK, I mean month- questions about PCR. Why did a Cambridge PCR test study of 10,000 people show 100% of their positives to be false? Even though Julian French doesn't give a source for this information, of course he doesn't, it was quite easy to find this copied and pasted around the echo chamber of the internet, each time with a slightly different wording. So here's someone who posted the claim with some figures. 9,000 plus students were tested at Cambridge University in the week up to December 6th, and every single one was found to be a false positive after a second test. Wow. So how many is that? Hundreds? Thousands? That's not conjecture, says the tweeter. That's Cambridge's own data. So does that mean the writer actually did her own research? Yes. Because in internet land, doing your own research means reading a tweet from someone else and mindlessly passing it on. And here's the tweet she passed on. 100% false positive rate found at Cambridge University Colleges following retests. The truth is emerging very quickly now. Retweet. Nah, instead of mindlessly retweeting this dubious claim, let's do some research and actually check the source it gives. In other words... Cambridge's own data. Here it is. The false positive rate for all pooled screening tests to date has been 1 in 373, 0.3%. That's very different to 100%. The Twitter sphere is out by a factor of over 300. So how did that happen? Well, first we need to understand what a false positive rate is. Here are 9,000 students, each figure representing 100 people about to get tested. We'll say 1,000 of them have coronavirus and just focus on those who aren't infected. That means there are 8,000 people in the group who don't have coronavirus lining up to get tested. When the results of the test come in, they all show a negative result except for 200 people whose samples are mistakenly read as positive. So these are false positives. That's what a false positive means. It means you're negative, but you mistakenly show up as a positive. So the way the false positive rate is calculated is to take the number of false positives and divide it by the number of false positives plus the number of true negatives. In our example, the false positive rate is therefore 200 out of 8,000, or 2.5%. So how did the tweeters end up with 100%? The first step to misrepresenting the Cambridge survey is to get the calculation wrong. Instead of dividing the number of false positives by the number of negatives plus false positives, which is the formula, whoever started this internet chatter divided the number of false positives by the number of positives. The next step is a familiar device known as cherry picking. Obviously, in a population with a very low infection rate, the number of true positives is going to be very low. So the percentage of false positives over true positives will be higher. When you get down to no infections at all, any positive readings you do get will, of course, be false. So when the amateurs took a look at the weekly results from Cambridge University, guess which week they cherry-picked? Of course, the only week when there were no infections at all. 
There were only 10 positives out of 9,376 people tested, and since no one was infected, they were all false. So to answer Julian French's question, how come testing of 10,000 people show 100% of their positives to be false, the reason is that none of the nearly 10,000 people was infected, according to testing. So dividing any false positive figure by itself even if it was just one false positive test out of a million people tested, would of course automatically give you 100%. The real false positive rate for that week was just 0.1%. And as we've seen, for the totality of the survey, it was 0.3%, which is not far off other estimates for false positive rates. You'll find these studies listed in the video description. So here's a suggestion to people like Julian French, Good PR Anna, Do Your Own Research, Julia Hartley Brewer and all the other members of the flock. If you read messages giving you some information and telling you to pass it on, you've got three choices. Either you can ignore it, which is a sensible thing to do if you don't know whether the information is true or not, or you could follow the crowd and do as you're told and mindlessly pass it on. Or you spend just a few minutes checking the information by going to the source. See if it says what the tweeters and retweeters and re-retweeters believe it says. Don't follow a person, follow the information trail. It could be the start of a whole new experience of thinking for yourself. <coughs> if you'd like to donate money to this channel, please don't. The best way to support it is to donate to a charity that I strongly endorse, which is detailed in the video description and on the link to this video. It provides health care for people living on the edge of tropical forests in exchange for not cutting down trees, something they were forced to do in the past to pay for medical treatment. It's had huge success in Indonesia and is now expanding into Madagascar and Brazil. Thanks to all those who've donated in the past and intend to do so now.